Our invitation song will be number 272, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Scripture reading will be from Mark chapter 2, 13 through 22. Mark chapter 2, 13 through 22. Then when he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many. And they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors, the sinners, they said to him, his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The disciples the disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friend of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have a bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sues a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts it, the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Good morning. May God bless the reading of his word. Good to see each of you here this morning. Wasn't that great news about the bond being paid off? Amen. I told the 9 o'clock group that uh, if Cody had been in that audience, he would have said amen. <laughs> Sounds like we had a few others uh, joining him this morning. Of course, what that means is that our contribution can go for something more important than two-by-fours and drywall. Amen. We, are, we have been planning for the last couple of years about how the funds can be redirected to uh, spreading the Word of God and strengthening and encouraging the congregation of Christians here. Uh, and so uh, some of that has already been presented to the congregation, but uh, we are excited about being able to do more things for the Lord's work. We have a Vacation Bible School meeting this afternoon. Curtis would like to meet with anyone who would like to talk about the Vacation Bible School this summer uh, in the classroom down this hallway. The ladies' prayer breakfast is this coming Saturday, 10 to 12, and next Lord's Day is Lad's Day. It's good to see everybody here this morning. In the middle of last year, in the middle of the year of pandemic, the University of Chicago presented a poll of Americans who found that 14% of Americans Adults say that they're very happy. Only 14%. The number actually was double that two years before in 2018. In 2018, 29%, 23% rather of Americans said that they felt isolated. That was two years before the pandemic. 23% of Americans said they felt isolated. There is a correlation between friendships and happiness. By the same reason, there's also a correlation between isolation and unhappiness. Ever since that particular survey started being taken in 1972, the number of Americans who have said that they were very happy has never been above 29%. There's no secret to being happy. It's not some kind of special knowledge what it takes to be happy. It's not some kind of special formula. Now, it might take some time for us to get the 
pieces in the place in order to reach that level of happiness, but it's not hard to know how to do it. What is hard is to do it, to put it into practice. It seems to me in my years of experience that there are far more people who would rather whine about what they don't have than to do what it takes to be happy. The first Sunday of every month this year, we are taking a walk with Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. In January, we looked at the whole first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Today, I want us to just focus on the verses that Alex read to us a moment ago. Would you turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Let's examine what it takes to live, to have a life well lived. Let's begin in verse 13 where Mark writes that Jesus went out again by the seashore, that would be the Sea of Galilee, and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. So Jesus goes out by the Sea of Galilee and multitudes of people flock to him and what does he do? He teaches them. By nature, Jesus was God in the flesh. But by profession, he was a teacher. Jesus taught people. Now there are topics that many people just don't want to hear about. There are things that you and I just don't want to learn about. But the one thing that we can't afford to stay ignorant about is how to have that life well lived. The way of Christianity the path to heaven. How to live a rich, fulfilling, satisfied life. How to be the best dad I can be. How to be the best father I can be. How to be the best mom I can be or the best wife I can be. How to be the best parents that I can be. How to be a good friend. How to be a good citizen in our country. All of those things have one thing in common. Following Jesus' teachings to a life well lived. Jesus is the master teacher. This is so important to the life of Jesus that Mark uses the verb to teach 17 times in 16 chapters. And all but one of those refer to Jesus as doing the teaching. Jesus in chapter 1 taught in the synagogue of Capernaum, verses 21 and 22. And when the people listened to him, the people were astonished that Jesus taught with authority. What that means is that Jesus did not quote rabbis for his authority. Jesus taught as if he knew exactly what was on every single page of the Old Testament. He taught it with authority. He explained the Old Testament and people around could see that Jesus knew what he was talking about. In Mark chapter 4, in verse 1, Jesus teaches by the Sea of Galilee and again a multitude of people come around him and Jesus teaches them in parables. That is, he would take everyday objects around them and he would, he would bring a spiritual lesson from it. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 2, again, Jesus was in the synagogues and the people were astonished at his wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is the ability to apply what you know in everyday life. Everywhere Jesus went, he taught. Mark chapter 6 and verse 6. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, there's a multitude of people that are there around Jesus. And Jesus says that they were like sheep. They were lost. And so what does Jesus do? Mark 6 and verse 34, he teaches them. That shows us that when people are lost, they need to be taught. Now that's one reason why many people just don't like the teachings of Jesus. They don't want to change their behavior. 
They might not be satisfied with their marriage or they're not satisfied with their family life. But when you show them what Jesus teaches, they don't want to change. Jesus was a teacher. Among the things he taught, Mark chapter 8 and verse 31, is that he was going to be handed over to the Jewish religious leaders and they were going to reject him and kill him. But on the third day, he was going to rise again. Jesus taught his disciples the same thing in chapter 9 and verse 31. Jesus wanted his disciples to be prepared for the coming crucifixion, but he wanted them to anticipate the resurrection. And so he taught them. But family, we serve more than just a crucified Savior and a resurrected Lord. Jesus is God in the flesh. And because He is God in the flesh, that means He's also the Lord. And if He's the Lord, that means He has the right to tell us how to live. Amen. And He knows what it takes to have the life well lived. And we've got to obey His teachings. If you look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 1, Mark says that Jesus goes into the region of Judea, which is beyond the Jordan on the western side of the Jordan River, and crowds gather around him. If you have your Bible open to Mark 10 and verse 1, I want you to notice that Mark says, as his custom was. He taught them. Jesus was a teacher. He taught and he taught and he taught. The more we know God's Word, the more like Jesus we're going to be. And the more we're going to have to share with others what Jesus teaches. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 14, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the Herodians were the more politically minded Jews, they come to Jesus and they acknowledge that Jesus taught the way of the Lord in truth. What they meant by that was that Jesus was not partial. He taught the Word of God and if it stepped on the toes of His own followers, then so be it. Because the truth has to be taught. Jesus was a teacher. And if we want to have the life well lived, then we're going to examine the teachings of Jesus Christ and we're going to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. And if we want our children to have a life well lived, then we're going to teach our children the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's point number one that we learned from this excerpt out of the life of Jesus. Let's look at number two. Look at verse 14. Mark writes that Jesus was passing by, this is again by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. Last month we looked at chapter 1, and we saw in verses 16 through 20 that Jesus found a couple of sets of brothers who were fishermen, who were in business together, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and he called all four of them to be his followers. And they dropped their nets right then and there, and they followed Jesus. Here Jesus calls a tax collector by the name of Levi, whose dad's name was Alphaeus. If we compare Matthew and Mark and Luke, we see that this Levi is the same man named Matthew. This Levi wrote the Gospel of Matthew. So he was sitting at the tax booth. There was a major road that ran through Capernaum in that day and time. It was called the Way of the Sea, Via Maris. It's an excellent location for a tax booth. And Matthew was a tax collector. As you might expect, tax collectors were not popular in the first century. Rachel and I knew a tax collector in the church down in Tennessee. He worked for the IRS. He was a Christian. He was a pretty good fellow. 
I think most of us don't mind paying taxes if they're not excessive, if they're not wasted, if they don't go to pay for things the Bible teaches are sinful. Matthew was a tax collector. But in the first century, tax collectors worked for the Roman emperor. And their taxes could be exorbitant. They were used to support an exorbitant lifestyle in the emperor. And not only that, but the tax collector was able to collect more than what the emperor said, and he lived off of that excess. So tax collectors tended to be fairly wealthy, and they tended to be extremely hated for that reason. But Jesus calls Matthew to be a tax collector, to be a follower of his. And Matthew left his tax booth, and he followed Jesus. Now, I don't know if Matthew lived on donations as apparently Jesus did during his three-year ministry. I don't know if he started tax collecting part-time. The Bible doesn't tell us how Matthew made a living. All it's concerned about is that he became a follower of Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus, to have a life well lived, is to follow Jesus exclusively. We cannot follow two people at the same time. If I'm going to follow a man or a woman, then they go this direction. If I'm going to follow them, then I've got to go that direction. If somebody else wants to go this direction, then I either have to stop following that person or follow that person or stop following that person and then follow this person. You can't follow two people at the same time. And so to follow Jesus Christ means to follow Him exclusively. He is our master teacher and He requires our complete allegiance to Him. Let's look at another example. Mark chapter 8. Turn over to Mark chapter 8 very quickly and let's look at what else Jesus said about being an exclusive follower of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 8 beginning in verse 34. Mark writes that Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. This illustrates here the exclusive nature of following Jesus Christ. We don't listen to Jesus and then decide if we want to follow Him or not. If we listen to Jesus and we follow Him, then it means we follow Him exclusively. And it's just that simple. Many Americans are like the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, What do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus started listing some of the Ten Commandments. And the young ruler said, I've done all of those things. What else do I need to do? Jesus was able to penetrate into his heart. And he said, there's one thing that's separating you from heaven. And it's your possessions. So all that you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. Mark 10 and verse 21. Rich young ruler couldn't do it. It was a price too high to pay. And so he turned away from Jesus. That's the price of following Jesus. He's got to be exclusive. If you have your Bibles open there to Mark chapter 10, I want you to notice that the Apostle Peter comes back to Jesus with a very similar question. Jesus, uh, Peter sees what happens to that rich young ruler and Peter comes to Jesus 
And he says to Jesus in verse 28, we have left all and followed you. Matthew includes the question, what is there in it for us? And Jesus tells them, here's the benefit of following me exclusively, verse 29. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much, underline this in your Bible, now in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Many who are first will be last and the last first. Observe in that text, family, that Jesus promises us that if we follow him exclusively, then he will bless us now in this present age. That's the life well lived. He also promises persecutions can come. And they will also have eternal life. If we want to have the life well lived... We've got to follow Jesus and His teachings exclusively. Turn back to Mark chapter 2. And let's look at our third point from this text, and that is that the sick need Jesus. Let's read beginning in verse 15. It happened that Jesus was reclining at the table in Matthew's house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and His disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following Him, and when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why? Why is he eating with the, and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, he shows that he is following Jesus. He wants to follow Jesus by hosting this dinner party and he invites other tax collectors and sinners to be a part of this dinner party. We don't know what kind of sinners these were. We don't know if they were immoral. Maybe they were adulterers and prostitutes. Maybe they were just simply Jews that were not following the law of Moses like they should. They weren't offering animal sacrifices, for example. So the tax collectors, they're guilty of extortion, maybe lying, not being kind to their fellow Jews. And then these other Jews that are not respecting the law of Moses in some way, but they're there together. And in fact, tax collector and sinner is used together as a phrase nine times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus is sitting there eating with them because they need salvation. The disciples of Christ are there with him, Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew. They're sitting there together in the audience. They see how Jesus is interacting with these tax collectors and sinners. They're listening to what Jesus is telling them. Jesus is telling them you need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's his message in Mark 1 and verse 15. But there were some the religious leaders who did not like Jesus associating with such people. Verse 16 identifies them as the scribes of the Pharisees. The scribes started out as a job where they copied down copies of the Law of Moses, the Old Testament on scrolls. They made these copies in order to share with the synagogues and maybe even wealthy Jews. And because they were so familiar with the law of Moses, they became teachers. And people would come to them for their advice about what the law said. And they were respected for their opinions. The Pharisees also respected the law. They respected the law to a degree that they built up what the Jews called a hedge around the law to keep you from violating the law. The problem was they, in their minds, made that hedge the law itself. That was their sin. So anyway, they come to Jesus and they see him eating with these tax collectors and sinners and they ask his disciples why. And God gives them a spiritual application of a common, ordinary, everyday practice. Healthy people don't go to a doctor. 
Now in the United States today, we are so wealthy that many of us go to the doctor for an annual checkup. Most societies don't do that. They don't have the money. Romanians don't do that. You only go to the doctor if you're sick. In fact, if you can treat yourself at home, you do that. It's cheaper. Jesus says healthy people don't go to a doctor. Healthy people don't need a doctor. And so Jesus identifies himself in a term that we have used today in modern terms, the great physician. When the nation of Israel came out of the exodus in Egypt, God assembles them around Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, God identifies himself as your healer. For Jesus here to identify himself as the great physician shows that Jesus identifies himself with Jehovah God. Jesus is the one who heals people of the pain and the ravages of sin. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners, Jesus says. But of course, Jesus would go on to point out that there is no one righteous in the eyes of God. Jesus could have quoted King David in Psalms chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, that there is none righteous in the eyes of God. No, not one. But those people in his audience who were self-righteous, they wouldn't see a need for the great physician. They wouldn't see a need to come to Jesus to be healed. But Jesus came to call sinners. He came to call those who mourn over their sins to come to Him to be healed, to be made righteous by the grace of God. Jesus came to make men and women right in the eyes of God. He came to offer His blood for the forgiveness of many. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Anyone who will listen to the teachings of Jesus and who will follow Him exclusively will find healing. Some of the behaviors that hurt us and make us sick in the eyes of God are given by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. These are the things that you and I as human beings struggle with and it hurts us, it separates us from God. This is the pain of sin. But Jesus came to heal us from these behaviors. He came to save us from the penalty of these behaviors and the destruction that is coming over those who engage in these practices. Jesus came to heal. And then the final point we'll bring out from our study from Mark chapter 2. Would you take, back, take a look back at Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Let's take another look at this event from the life of Jesus. Beginning in verse 18, John's disciples. And the Pharisees were fasting... And they came and they said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, and the new, the new from the old, and the worst tear results. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. This whole discussion is an illustration of the point that Christians do not live under the law of Moses. That is one of the most misunderstood points in Protestantism around the world today, that you have to obey the Ten Commandments to be saved. But this discussion points the question of salvation in a completely different direction. First of all, the Pharisees and John's disciples both questioned Jesus' disciples about fasting. The law of Moses never required fasting. The first time the verb to fast is used in the Old Testament is in the book of Judges. But what seems to have happened is that the, the Israelites, the Jews, substituted an outward form, fasting, 
for the inward virtue that God actually did require, and that was humility. So the Pharisees, like they did in so many other ways, they came up with a, a whole calendar of days and reasons why they should fast. But in the process, they ignored what God had actually required. And that was humility at the teachings of God. And so they come to Jesus on this occasion with this question. And Jesus gives them a broader answer. First of all, he says, The attendants of the bridegroom do not fast as long as the bridegroom is with them. Jesus, of course, is the bridegroom. But he says the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. That happened when Jesus was crucified. He was killed. He was buried in the earth. And so they fasted. And they wept and they mourned because they were separated from the bridegroom. But when Jesus rose from the dead, family Jesus promised us in Matthew 28 and verse 20, I'll never leave you again. I'm going to be with you until the end of the age. So generally speaking, there's no reason for Christians to fast today. You know, there is so much ignorance and lack of Bible knowledge across the land. And one of them has to do with fasting. We're not going to get into an in-depth study of that this morning. We don't have the time. But back during this political season, there were people who were saying, we need to fast because of the direction of our country. That is a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches about fasting. I don't fast to get you to repent. I don't fast to get Joe Biden to repent. I fast because I need to repent. Fasting is a personal thing. Fasting is showing that I am sorry for my sins. So much ignorance. Lack of Bible knowledge. And so these people came to Jesus. And in the same way that fasting was not required under the law of Moses, fasting is not required under the law of Christ either. There's only two examples in the New Testament where Christians fasted. In Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. And after that, fasting doesn't have a part to play in New Testament Christianity. But humility does. Now to illustrate Jesus' point, he says, verses 21 and 22, he uses two examples, again, normal, everyday, common objects. Jesus uses the example of a piece of new, unshrunk cloth that is stitched into an old garment. If you wash the garment, the new piece of cloth is going to shrink and it's going to pull away from the old and it's going to rip the garment. That's what happens, family. If you try to force the new covenant of Jesus Christ into old covenant forms. Now, Christianity has some continuity with the law of Moses. But it has some major differences. One of those we're going to examine tonight at our 5 o'clock worship. Christians don't use mechanical instruments of music and worship. When the Jews became Christians, they left the mechanical instruments of music in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about that tonight. 5 o'clock. You can join us in person or online. The second example Jesus uses here in our context is in verse 22. Look at verse 22. Jesus says that you don't put new wine that is still in the process of fermentation, is still giving off gases. You don't put that new wine into old wineskins that have already been stretched as far as they can stretch. If you do, then the new wine fermenting is going to create gases and it's going to burst the old wineskins. Then you've lost your wine and your wineskins. But you put new wine and the new wineskins, and both are preserved. Again, the new covenant of Jesus Christ is different from the old, old covenant. And when you try to take aspects of the old covenant and superimpose it on top of the new covenant, it's like trying to hammer square pegs into a round hole. It won't work. 
So family, we have taken a brief look at just a few days out of the life of Jesus Christ, looking for the answer to how to live a well-lived life. We've got to learn from Jesus. And we have to follow Jesus exclusively. And if we need to be healed from sins, we go to Jesus and Him exclusively. And we do what Jesus tells us to do. We don't follow the Old Covenant. We follow the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And so a decision is yours this morning if you need to make your life right with God. If you need to be immersed in the Jesus Christ so that your sins can be washed away by His blood, we can help you do that this morning. If you need to come to Christ saying, I've not been faithful. I've been trying to follow two different people. Stop following self. Follow Jesus Christ in His Word. And I will promise you, on the authority of Jesus Christ, that you can have the life well lived. If we can help you this morning, let us know. Let's stand and sing together.